Chapter Seven of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Four, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Seven: Washington in Danger thanks to the promptness of governor andrew the eighth massachusetts was not far behind the sixth it assembled on boston common on thursday morning and was in philadelphia on friday evening april nineteenth just in time to hear the authentic reports as well as the multiplied and exaggerated rumors of that day's doings of the baltimore mob and the tragic fate of some of their comrades of the sixth massachusetts having agreed to double her quota the four regiments thus to be received formed a brigadier general's command and for this command governor andrew designated benjamin f butler who already held that office and rank under the state militia laws he was a lawyer by profession but possessed in an eminent degree the peculiarly american quality of ability to adapt himself to any circumstance or duty with a quick perception to discover and a ready courage to seize opportunities it must be noted in passing that he was a radical democrat in politics and could boast that he had voted fifty times in the late charleston convention to make jefferson davis the democratic candidate for president but with the same positive zeal he denounced secession and helped to prepare the massachusetts regiments to join in suppressing it by the authority and with the power of the federal government arrived with the eighth massachusetts at philadelphia general butler that night telegraphed further news of the day's fighting to governor andrew i have reason to believe that colonel jones has gone through to washington two killed only of the massachusetts men we shall go through at once the road is torn up through baltimore will telegraph again later information caused him to modify his intention to press on the baltimore railroad refused to carry any more troops into that city and if it had not the burning of the bridges made it impossible to do so in this dilemma the philadelphia railroad authorities had bethought them of a new route that by annapolis previously described the plan required not only much discussion but great additional preparation and friday night and part of saturday passed before it was pronounced even probably feasible by this time the seventh regiment of new york the corps d'elite of the whole union which on friday afternoon started its march down broadway through that tempest of cheers two miles long had also reached philadelphia where it too like the eighth massachusetts was obliged seriously to study the further ways and means of getting to washington the various railroad and military officials in philadelphia strongly advised the annapolis route and colonel marshall lefferts commanding the seventh telegraphed to cameron asking orders to go that way there was long delay in transmitting the dispatch and awaiting a reply and before the requested permission came colonel lefferts changed his purpose chartered a steamship placed his regiment on board and started for washington by way of the delaware river and bay and the potomac river this decision being apparently not a little hastened by certain military rivalries and jealousies which sprang up between colonel lefferts and brigadier general butler acting as yet under separate state authority and being therefore independent of each other's control scott's reply to send troops by havre de grace and annapolis as suggested at length came through the somewhat deranged telegraph offices and lefferts being gone the order was communicated to butler while the seventh new york under lefferts was steaming down delaware bay on the transport boston the eighth massachusetts under butler proceeded by cars to perryville opposite havre de grace and embarking on the ferry-boat maryland steamed down chesapeake bay and by midnight was anchored off annapolis 
as events turned out this division of forces proved an advantage since neither of the boats was capable of containing both regiments and twenty-four hours later the boston joined the maryland at annapolis before either regiment had disembarked the small and antiquated town of annapolis the capital of maryland and the seat of the united states naval academy was for the moment in sympathy with secession governor hicks had returned here from baltimore it being his official residence to make ready for the special session of the maryland legislature which in one of his moments of timidity he had been prevailed upon to call together to meet on the twenty sixth of april the governor and the mayor of annapolis both strongly urged butler not to land his men to which he replied that he must land to get provisions and in turn requested the governor's formal consent pending this diplomatic small talk butler found a piece of work to do the old frigate constitution of historic fame was anchored off the grounds of the naval academy as a training ship a few boatloads of baltimore roughs might easily cut her out and convert her into a privateer commandant george s blake who with the majority of his officers and cadets remained loyal asked butler to help pull her farther out into the bay for better security against capture in this enterprise the greater part of sunday the twenty first of april was spent the two sunday interviews of the mayor of baltimore with president lincoln and the resulting arrangement that troops should hereafter come by the annapolis route have been detailed the telegraph in the meantime was still working though with delays and interruptions as an offset to the disagreeable necessity of ordering the pennsylvania troops back from cockeysville the cheering news of butler's arrival at annapolis had come directly to hand that same sunday afternoon president lincoln and his cabinet met at the navy department where they might deliberate in greater seclusion and the culminating dangers to the government underwent scrutinizing inquiry and anxious comment the events of friday saturday and sunday as developed by the military reports and the conferences with the baltimore committees exhibited a degree of real peril such as had not menaced the capital since the british invasion in eighteen fourteen virginia was in arms on one side maryland on the other the railroad was broken the potomac was probably blockaded a touch would sever the telegraph of this occasion the president afterwards said it became necessary for me to choose whether using only the existing means agencies and processes which congress had provided i should let the government at once fall into ruin or whether availing myself of the broader powers conferred by the constitution in cases of insurrection i would make an effort to save it with all its blessings for the present age and for posterity surveying the emergency in its remote as well as present aspects and assuming without hesitation the responsibilities which existing laws did not authorize but which the needs of the hour imperatively demanded lincoln made a series of orders designed to meet as well as might be the new crisis in public affairs a convoy was ordered out to guard the california steamers bringing heavy shipments of gold fifteen merchant steamers were ordered to be purchased or chartered and armed at the navy yards of boston new york and philadelphia for coast protection and blockade service two million dollars were placed in the hands of three eminent citizens of new york john a dix george opdyke and richard m blatchford to be in their judgment dispersed for the public defense another commission of leading citizens of new york george d morgan william m evarts richard m blatchford and moses h grinnell in connection with governor edwin d morgan was empowered to exercise practically the full authority of the war and navy departments in organizing troops and forwarding supplies two of the ablest naval officers were authorized each to arm two additional merchant vessels to cruise in the potomac river and chesapeake bay and sundry minor measures and precautions were taken
before these various orders could even be prepared for transmittal the crowning embarrassment had come upon the government on that sunday night april twenty one the telegraph operator at baltimore reported that the insurrectionary authorities had taken possession of his office to which the washington telegraph superintendent laconically added of course this stops all so the prospect closed on sunday night monday forenoon brought rather an exaggeration of the symptoms of danger governor hicks influenced by his secession surroundings at annapolis neither having consented to butler's landing nor yet having dissuaded him from that purpose turned his appeals to the president i feel it my duty he wrote most respectfully to advise you that no more troops be ordered or allowed to pass through maryland and that the troops now off annapolis be sent elsewhere and i most respectfully urge that a truce be offered by you so that the effusion of blood may be prevented i respectfully suggest that lord lyons be requested to act as mediator between the contending parties of our country the suggestion was not only absurd in itself but it awakened painful apprehension lest his hitherto friendly disposition might suddenly change to active hostility this was a result to be avoided for even in his present neutral mood he was still an effective breakwater against those who were striving day and night to force maryland into some official act of insurrection mr seward therefore wrote the governor a very kindly and yet dignified rebuke reminding him of the days when a general of the american union with forces designed for the defense of its capital was not unwelcome anywhere in the state of maryland and certainly not at annapolis and suggesting at its close that no domestic contention whatever that may arise among the parties of this republic ought in any case to be referred to any foreign arbitrament least of all to the arbitrament of an european monarchy meanwhile another baltimore committee found its way to the president this time from one of the religious bodies of that city with a baptist clergyman as its spokesman who bluntly proposed that mr lincoln should recognize the independence of the southern states though such audacity greatly taxed his patience he kept his temper and replied that neither the president nor congress possessed the power or authority to do this and to the further request that no more troops be sent through maryland he answered in substance you gentlemen come here to me and ask for peace on any terms and yet have no word of condemnation for those who are making war on us you express great horror of bloodshed and yet would not lay a straw in the way of those who are organizing in virginia and elsewhere to capture this city the rebels attack fort sumter and your citizens attack troops sent to the defense of the government and the lives and property in washington and yet you would have me break my oath and surrender the government without a blow there is no washington in that no jackson in that there is no manhood or honor in that i have no desire to invade the south but i must have troops to defend this capital geographically it lies surrounded by the soil of maryland and mathematically the necessity exists that they should come over her territory our men are not moles and can't dig under the earth they are not birds and can't fly through the air there is no way but to march across and that they must do but in doing this there is no need of collision keep your rowdies in baltimore and there will be no bloodshed go home and tell your people that if they will not attack us we will not attack them but if they do attack us we will return it and that severely washington now began to take on some of the aspects of a siege 
the large stores of flour and grain at the georgetown mills and even that already loaded for shipment on schooners were seized and long trains of carts were engaged in removing it to safer storage in the public buildings prices of provisions were rising the little passenger steamers plying on the potomac were taken possession of by the military officers to be used for guard and picket duty on the river the doors windows and stairways of the public buildings were protected by barricades and the approaches to them guarded by sentinels all travel and nearly all business came to a standstill and theatres and places of amusement were closed with the first notice of the burning of the railroad bridges the strangers visitors and transient sojourners in the city became possessed of an uncontrollable desire to get away so long as the trains ran to baltimore they proceeded to that point from there they sought to escape northward by whatever chances of transportation offered themselves by some of these fugitives the government had taken the precaution to send duplicates of important orders and dispatches to northern cities this suave keeper quickly denuded washington of its redundant population while the unionist non-combatants were flying northward the secessionists were making quite as hurried an escape to the south for it was strongly rumored that the government intended to impress the whole male population of washington into military service for the defense of the city one incidental benefit grew out of the panic the government was quickly relieved of its treasonable servants some hundreds of clerks resigned out of the various departments on this monday april twenty two and the impending danger not only brought these to final decision but also many officers of high grades and important functions commodore franklin buchanan in charge of the washington navy yard together with nearly all his subordinate officers suddenly discovered their unwillingness longer to keep their oaths and serve the united states and that night this invaluable navy depot with all its vast stores of material its immense workshops and priceless machinery was entrusted solely to the loyalty and watchfulness of commander john a dahlgren and a little handful of marines scarcely enough in number to have baffled half a dozen adroit incendiaries or to ascertain the street gossip outside the walls of the establishment among the scores of army and navy resignations reported the same day was that of captain john b magruder first artillery then in command of a light battery on which general scott had placed special reliance for the defense of washington no single case of defection gave lincoln such astonishment and pain as this one only three days ago he said when the fact was made known to him magruder came voluntarily to me in this room and with his own lips and in my presence repeated over and over again his asseverations and protestations of loyalty and fidelity it was not merely the loss of an officer valuable and necessary though he might be in the emergency but the significance of this crowning act of perfidy which troubled the president and to the suggestiveness of which he could not close his eyes was there not only no patriotism left but was all sense of personal obligation of everyday honesty and of manliness of character gone also was everything crumbling at his touch in whom should he place confidence to whom should he give orders if clerks and captains and commodores and quartermaster generals and governors of states and justices of the supreme court proved false in the moment of need if men of the character and rank of the magruders the buchanans the macaulays the lees the johnstons the coopers the campbells were giving way where might he not fear treachery there was certainly no danger that all the officers of the government would thus prove recreant but might not the failure of a single one bearing an important trust cause a vital and irreparable disaster the perplexities and uncertainties of the hour are set forth with frank brevity by general scott in the report which was sent to the president that night of monday april twenty two i have but little that is certain to report 
viz first that there are three or four steamers off annapolis with volunteers for washington second that their landing will be opposed by the citizens reinforced from baltimore third that the landing may be effected nevertheless by good management and fourth that the rails on the annapolis road twenty miles have been taken up several efforts to communicate with those troops today have failed but three other detached persons are repeating the attempt and one or more of them will i think succeed once ashore the regiments if but two and there are probably more would have no difficulty in reaching washington on foot other than the want of wagons to transport camp equipage and the quartermaster that i have sent there i do not know that he has arrived has orders to hire wagons if he can and if not to impress etc of rumors the following are probable viz first that from fifteen hundred to two thousand troops are at the white house four miles below mount vernon a narrow point in the potomac engaged in erecting a battery second that an equal force is collected or in progress of assemblage on the two sides of the river to attack fort washington and third that extra cars went up yesterday to bring down from harper's ferry about two thousand other troops to join in a general attack on this capital that is on many of its fronts at once i feel confident that with our present forces we can defend the capital the arsenal and all the executive buildings seven against ten thousand troops not better than our district volunteers tuesday morning came but no news from annapolis no volunteers up the potomac it was cabinet day and about noon after the president and his counselors were assembled messengers announced the arrival of two steamers at the navy yard there was a momentary hope that these might be the long-expected ships from new york but inquiries proved them to be the pawnee and a transport on their return from the expedition to norfolk the worst apprehensions concerning that important post were soon realized it was irretrievably lost the only bit of comfort to be derived from the affair was that the vessels brought back a number of marines and sailors who would now add a little fraction of strength to the defense of the capital the officers of the expedition were soon before the president and cabinet and related circumstantially the tale of disaster and destruction which the treachery of a few officers and the credulity of the commandant had rendered unavoidable the gosport navy yard at norfolk virginia was of such value and importance that its safety from the very beginning of mr lincoln's administration had neither been overlooked nor neglected but like every other exposed or threatened point like sumter pickens tortugas key west fort monroe baltimore harpers ferry and washington itself its fate was involved in the want of an army and navy of adequate strength the day the president resolved on the sumter expedition two hundred and fifty seamen had been ordered from brooklyn to norfolk to render gosport more safe instead of going there it was thought necessary to change their destination to sumter and pickens and so though the danger to gosport was not lost sight of the reinforcements to ward it off were never available the officers of the navy yard were outwardly loyal the commandant had grown gray in the service of his country and enjoyed the full confidence of his equals and superiors it was known that the secessionists had designs upon the post but it was believed that the watchfulness which had been ordered and the measures of precaution which had been arranged under the special supervision of two trusted officers of the navy department who were carrying out the personal instructions of secretary wells would meet the danger at a critical moment commandant charles s macaulay committed a fatal mistake the subordinate officers of the yard professing loyalty practiced treason and lured him into their designs several valuable vessels lay at the navy yard to secure them eventually for virginia governor letcher had among his first acts of hostility attempted to obstruct the channel from norfolk to fort monroe by means of sunken vessels but the effort failed the passage still remained practicable ascertaining this commodore james alden and chief engineer benjamin f isherwood 
specially sent for the task by secretary wells had with the help of the commandant of the yard prepared the best ships the merrimac the germantown the plymouth and the dolphin for quick removal to fort monroe the engines of the merrimac were put in order the fires under her boilers were lighted the moment of her departure had been announced when suddenly a change came over the spirit of commandant macaulay virginia passed her ordinance of secession the traitorous officers of the navy yard were about to throw off their mask and desert their flag and as a parting stroke of intrigue they persuaded the commandant that he must retain the merrimac for the security of the yard yielding to this treacherous advice he countermanded her permission to depart and ordered her fires to be put out thus baffled isherwood and alden hastened back to washington to obtain the superior orders of the secretary over this most unexpected and astounding action they reached washington on this errand respectively on the eighteenth and nineteenth of april just at the culminating point of insurrection and danger hasty consultations were held and energetic orders were issued the pawnee just returned from her sumter cruise was again cold supplied and fitted out processes consuming precious hours but which could not be omitted on the evening of april nineteen she steamed down the potomac under command of commodore hiram paulding with discretionary orders to defend or to destroy next evening april twenty having landed at fort monroe and taken on board three to five hundred men of the third massachusetts only that morning arrived from boston and who embarked without a single ration the pawnee proceeded to norfolk passing without difficulty through the seven sunken hulks in the elizabeth river but commodore paulding was too late the commandant once more successfully plied with insidious advice had yielded to the second suggestion of his juniors and had scuttled the removable ships ostensibly to prevent their being seized and used by the rebels as they were slowly sinking no effort to remove them could succeed and no resource was left but to destroy everything so far as could be done accordingly there being bright moonlight the greater part of saturday night was devoted to the work of destruction several parties were detailed to fire the ships and the buildings and to lay a mine to blow up the dry dock and the sky was soon lighted by an immense conflagration yet with all this effort the sacrifice was left incomplete not more than half the buildings were consumed the workshops with their valuable machinery escaped the fifteen hundred to two thousand heavy cannon in the yard could neither be removed nor rendered unserviceable some unforeseen accident finally prevented the explosion of the dry dock of the seven ships burned to the water's edge the hull of the merrimac was soon afterwards raised and in the course of events changed by the rebels into the ironclad merrimac or as they named her the virginia at five o'clock on sunday morning the pawnee considered her work finished and steamed away from gosport followed by the sailing ship cumberland no point of peril had been so clearly foreseen and apparently so securely guarded against as the loss of the three or four valuable ships at norfolk and yet in spite of foresight and precaution they had gone to worse than ruin through the same train of circumstances which had lost sumter and permitted the organization of the montgomery rebellion the loss of ships and guns was however not all behind these was the damaging moral effect upon the union cause and feeling for four consecutive days each day had brought a great disaster virginia's secession on the seventeenth the burning of harper's ferry on the eighteenth the baltimore riot and destruction of railroad bridges on the nineteenth the abandonment and destruction of the great navy yard and its ships on the night of the twentieth this began to look like an irresistible current of fate no popular sentiment could long stem such a tide of misfortune the rebels of virginia maryland and especially of washington began to feel that providence wrought in their behalf and that their conspiracy was already crowned with success 
evidently with such a feeling on this same tuesday associate justice john a campbell still a member of the supreme court and under oath to support the constitution of the united states again sent a letter of aid and comfort to jefferson davis he wrote maryland is the object of chief anxiety with the north and the administration their fondest hope will be to command the chesapeake and relieve this capital their pride and their fanaticism would be sadly depressed by a contrary issue this will be the great point of contest in all negotiations i incline to think that they are prepared to abandon the south of the potomac but not beyond maryland is weak she has no military men of talents and i did hear that colonel huger was offered command and declined it however his resignation had not been accepted huger is plainly not competent for such a purpose lee is in virginia think of the condition of baltimore and provide for it for there is the place of danger the events at baltimore have placed a new aspect upon everything to the north there is a perfect storm there while it has to be met no unnecessary addition should be made to increase it another night of feverish public unrest another day of anxiety to the president wednesday april twenty four there was indeed no attack on the city but on the other hand no arrival of troops to place its security beyond doubt repetition of routine duties repetition of unsubstantial rumors long faces in the streets a holiday quiet over the city closed shutters and locked doors of business houses the occasional clatter of a squad of cavalry from point to point sentinels about the department sentinels about the executive mansion willard's hotel which a week before was swarming with busy crowds now deserted as if smitten by a plague with only furtive servants to wake echoes along the vacant corridors an oppressive contrast to the throng of fashion and beauty which has so lately made it a scene of festivity from midday to midnight ever since the telegraph stopped on sunday night the washington operators had been listening for the ticking of their instruments and had occasionally caught fugitive dispatches passing between maryland secessionists which were for the greater part immediately known to be untrustworthy for general scott kept up a series of military scouts along the baltimore railroad as far as annapolis junction twenty miles from washington from which point a branch railroad ran at a right angle to the former twenty miles to annapolis on chesapeake bay the general dared not risk a detachment permanently to hold the junction no considerable secession force had been encountered and the railroad was yet safe but it was known or at least strongly probable that the volunteers from the north had been at annapolis since sunday morning why did they not land why did they not advance the annapolis road was known to be damaged but could they not march twenty miles the previous day april twenty three had by some lucky chance brought a new york mail three days old the newspapers in it contained breezy premonitions of the northern storm anderson's enthusiastic reception the departure of the seventh new york regiment the sailing of governor sprague with his rhode islanders the monster meeting in union square with the outpouring of half a million of people in processions and listening to speeches from half a dozen different stands the energetic measures of the new york common council the formation of the union defense committee whole columns of orders and proclamations the flag raisings the enlistments the chartering and freighting of ships and from all quarters news of the wild jubilant uprising of the whole immense population of the free states all this was gratifying pride kindling reassuring and yet read and re-read with avidity in washington that day it would always bring after it the galling reflection that all this magnificent outburst of patriotism was paralyzed by the obstacle of a twenty miles march between annapolis and the junction had the men of the north no legs lincoln by nature and habit so calm so equable so undemonstrative nevertheless passed this period of interrupted communication and isolation from the north in a state of nervous tension which put all his great powers of mental and physical endurance to their severest trial 
general scott's reports though invariably expressing his confidence in successful defense frankly admitted the evident danger and the president with his acuteness of observation and his rapidity and correctness of inference lost no single one of the external indications of doubt and apprehension day after day prediction failed and hope was deferred troops did not come ships did not arrive railroads remained broken messengers failed to reach their destination that fact itself demonstrated that he was environed by the unknown and that whether a union or a secession army would first reach the capital was at best an uncertainty to a coarse or vulgar nature such a situation would have brought only one of two feelings either overpowering personal fear or overweening bravado but lincoln almost a giant in physical stature and strength combined in his intellectual nature a masculine courage and power of logic with an ideal sensitiveness of conscience and a sentimental tenderness as delicate as a woman's this presidential trust which he had assumed was to him not a mere regalia of rank and honor its terrible duties and responsibilities seemed rather a coat of steel armor heavy to bear and cutting remorselessly into the quick flesh that one of the successors of washington should find himself even to this degree in the hands of his enemies was personally humiliating but that the majesty of a great nation should be thus insulted and its visible symbols of authority be placed in jeopardy above all that the hitherto glorious example of the republic to other nations should stand in this peril of surprise and possible sudden collapse the constitution be scoffed and human freedom become a byword and reproach this must have begotten him an anxiety approaching torture in the eyes of his countrymen and of the world he was holding the scales of national destiny he alone knew that for the moment the forces which made the beam vibrate with such uncertainty were beyond his control in others society he gave no sign of these inner emotions but once on the afternoon of the twenty-third the business of the day being over the executive office deserted after walking the floor alone in silent thought for nearly half an hour he stopped and gazed long and wistfully out of the window down the potomac in the direction of the expected ships and unconscious of other presence in the room at length broke out with irrepressible anguish in the repeated exclamation why don't they come why don't they come one additional manifestation of this bitterness of soul occurred on the day following though in a more subdued manner the wounded soldiers of the sixth massachusetts including several officers came to pay a visit to the president they were a little shy when they entered the room having the traditional new england awe of authorities and rulers lincoln received them with sympathetic kindness which put them at ease after the interchange of the first greetings his words of sincere thanks for their patriotism and their suffering his warm praise of their courage his hearty recognition of their great service to the public and his earnestly expressed confidence in their further devotion quickly won their trust he spoke to them of the position and prospect of the city contrasting their prompt arrival with the unexplained delay which seemed to have befallen the regiments supposed to be somewhere on their way from the various states pursuing this theme he finally fell into a tone of irony to which only intense feeling ever drove him i begin to believe said he that there is no north the seventh regiment is a myth rhode island is another you are the only real thing there are few parchment brevets as precious as such a compliment at such a time from such a man however much the tardiness of the annapolis reinforcements justified the president's sarcasm they were at last actually approaching 
we left butler engaged in assisting the schoolship constitution to a more secure position the aid proved effectual but the day's work ended by the ferry-boat maryland with the eighth massachusetts still on board getting hard aground in the shoal water of annapolis harbor in this helpless predicament with nothing to eat but hard pilot bread and raw salt pork furnished from the constitution and with no water to drink the regiment passed the night of sunday early next morning monday april twenty two the boston arrived bringing the seventh new york and thus these two regiments so lately parted at philadelphia were once more united colonel lefferts had proceeded on his independent course to fort monroe but receiving no intelligence concerning the potomac route concluded after all to adopt the more prudent plan of steaming up chesapeake bay to annapolis the boston at once set to work but without eventual success to pull the maryland into deeper water meanwhile the officers of the two regiments were holding interviews and correspondence with commandant blake of the naval school on the one hand and with the maryland authorities on the other governor hicks in punctilious assertion of the paramount state sovereignty of maryland protested in writing against landing the troops the mayor of annapolis joined in the protest though privately both declared that maryland was loyal to the union and that they would make no military resistance that afternoon both regiments were landed there was yet a certain friction of military jealousy and refusal to cooperate between butler and lefferts both were eager to proceed to washington but differed in their plans and the many and apparently authentic rumors of the opposing force that would meet them from baltimore caused discussion and delay they had no transportation few rations and little ammunition butler took the first practical measures by ordering the railroad depot and buildings to be occupied here an old locomotive was found the machinery of which had been carefully disarranged the mechanical skill of the yankee militiamen now asserted its value private charles homans of the eighth massachusetts at once recognized the locomotive as having been built in our shop and calling to his help several machinists like himself from the massachusetts regiment they had no great difficulty in putting it in running order tuesday morning april twenty three showing still no warlike demonstrations from any quarter the surroundings of the town were reconnoitred and two companies of the eighth massachusetts pushed out three and a half miles along the railroad a beginning was also made towards repairing the track which was found torn up and displaced here and there in this work and in testing the newly repaired locomotive and improvising a train another day slipped by in the evening however two of the eight messengers sent out from washington to annapolis succeeded in reaching there the second one bringing the definite orders of general scott that butler should remain and hold the place and that the advancing troops should repair the railroad that night also came four or more steamships with as many additional regiments of volunteers wednesday morning april twenty four being the fourth day at annapolis for the eighth massachusetts and the third for the seventh new york they started on their twenty miles march to the junction a couple of extemporized platform cars on which the seventh mounted their little brass howitzers the patched-up locomotive and two rickety passenger cars constituted their artillery baggage supply ambulance and construction train all in one thus provided the two regiments marched scouted laid track and built bridges as occasion required now fraternizing and cooperating with hearty good will it was slow and tedious work they were not inured to nor provided for even such holiday campaigning as this luckily they had fine weather a warm sunny spring day succeeded by a clear night with a full moon to light it so they clung pluckily to their duty hungry and sleepy though they were all day and all night of wednesday and arrived at the junction about daybreak of thursday all the previous rumors had taught them that here they might expect a rebel force and fight the anticipation proved groundless 
they learned on the contrary that a train from washington had come to this place for them the day before it soon again made its appearance and quickly embarking on it by noon the seventh new york was at its destination those who were in the federal capital on that thursday april twenty five will never during their lives forget the event an indescribable gloom had hung over washington nearly a week paralyzing its traffic and crushing out its life as soon as the arrival was known an immense crowd gathered at the depot to obtain ocular evidence that relief had at length reached the city promptly debarking and informing the seventh marched up pennsylvania avenue to the white house as they passed up the magnificent street with their well-formed ranks their exact military step their soldierly bearing their gaily floating flags and the inspiring music of their splendid regimental band they seemed to sweep all thought of danger and all taint of treason out of that great national thoroughfare and out of every human heart in the federal city the presence of this single regiment seemed to turn the scales of fate cheer upon cheer greeted them windows were thrown up houses open the population came forth upon the streets as for a holiday it was an epoch in american history for the first time the combined spirit and power of liberty entered the nation's capital End of chapter seven